All right, welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about continuity and continuous functions. And so we're just going to start with the definition of continuous that we're going to take for AP Calculus. The function f is continuous at x equals c if the limit of the function is equal to the value of the function at x equals c. So we got these two things that need to be the same. We've got the limit and we've got the value. Okay, so I'm going to just draw you a picture of what this would look like. Right. If we've got the limit existing, which it would need to exist in order to equal the value, um, uh, there's going to be you know some spot that we're approaching. Okay, and we know because the limit exists that from either side, from the left and the right, the graph needs to be approaching that open circle. Okay, but we know more than that now. We know that f of c, the value of the function, has to be equal to the value of the limit. So what we need is for the circle to be filled in there. Okay? And that's what it means to be continuous. A continuous function can be drawn in one stroke of the pen without lifting the pen off the paper, which is somehow a really good definition, but also not that mathematical. Okay? And we're not going to get into the epsilons and deltas of continuity in this video. If you're interested in that, you can maybe go check out the multivariable calculus playlist. Okay, so let's talk about types of discontinuities. <laughs> Right, now in this class, there's going to be three types of discontinuities that we need to be aware of. And really, they boil down into removable versus non-removable. Okay, the removable discontinuity, that's going to be the first one. The other two are going to be non-removable. Okay, now a removable discontinuity, that's just a hole in the graph. So let me just you know, kind of draw you a picture of that. Um, here's a graph with a hole in it. We know how that happens. It's typically by us, you know, factoring stuff, canceling identical factors, and wherever we canceled, that corresponds to the location of the hole. What I will say also about this is if that's, this is what we're used to, right? You cancel it off, there's a hole in the graph. But we've also seen some problems with, you know, here's a graph um, that had a filled-in circle elsewhere. And so what I just want to say is that f of c may or may not exist, but if it does exist, then the value of f at x equals c is not going to be equal to the value of the limit of f at x equals c. When it comes to an infinite discontinuity, that is kind of what it sounds like. It's, you know, the function's discontinuous because it's going towards infinity. That's a vertical asymptote. Okay, so we know what those look like. Let me draw you a quick picture of that. And then it's x equals c. We've got a vertical asymptote. Okay, that's an infinite discontinuity. That is under the category of non-removable, but I'll just make that annotation here in a minute. And the last type of discontinuity we've got is a jump discontinuity, which is sometimes rare, but we've seen how this happens. We've seen the causes of it. Uh, the thing where you're taking the absolute value of an object and divide it by that same object, that can cause a jump discontinuity. Piecewise defined functions, those can cause a jump discontinuity as well. It kind of looks like this. we got one thing happening and then suddenly it jumps to something else. And, you know, really what this looks like, hopefully to you, is like, oh, wait, this is the type of thing where if he asked me, does what's the value of the limit? I say the limit doesn't exist. And that's kind of the hallmark of a jump discontinuity. The limit fails to exist because one-sided limits disagree. That's what we're going to see with a jump discontinuity. All right, so just in conclusion, I want to emphasize that the hole in the graph, you know, whether or not the function exists at that point, uh, that's a removable discontinuity. And that these two here uh, would be uh, categorized as non-removable. All right, now, for example, look at this problem right here. This is a very typical AP Calculus question that covers continuity. Find the value of k that makes f continuous. We've got a piecewise defined function, f, and we want it to be continuous. And it will be continuous if the two pieces of graph meet up at that x value that they kind of share at x equals 2. So how we're going to figure that out algebraically is we're going to set the two pieces equal to each other. So we're going to say x squared minus 3x plus 9 is equal to kx plus 1. But then, you know, we've got x's and k's in this equation. And if we want to solve for k, we're going to have to plug in something for x. So we're going to need to plug in x equals 2. Okay, when we do that, we should probably plug in 2 in parentheses, you know, just be of the habit in case we're needing to plug in, like, say, negative 3 or something, like a negative number, and we're taking it to a power. That's where the parentheses are going to be useful. Um, 2 squared minus 3 twos plus 9 equals k times 2 plus 1. We're going to kind of clean that up and say, all right, that's 4 minus 6 plus 9 equals 2k plus 1. And then 4 minus 6 plus 9, that feels like 7. So if I've got 7 equaling 2k plus 1, 
I could subtract 1 from both sides, divide by 2, and I would see that k needs to equal 3. Okay. Now, that's a very algebraic perspective, but to give you a graphical idea, kind of, of what's happening here, I might draw you uh, these two pieces of the piecewise function. Okay, we've got a parabola that's ending just a little bit after its vertex, it faces up, and then we've got this line, or part of a line. I wouldn't say it's a line segment because it goes on forever, but you know, geometers could tell me exactly what that is. What we're doing is we're going to manipulate this. You know, this isn't exactly what it is because k is going to dictate the slope. But what we're doing is we're just going to kind of like work this so that happens, right? So that the two pieces are meeting up. And that's what we did algebraically there. Okay, now let's bump it up a level. Let's uh, look at a piecewise function that's got three pieces and find the values of a and b that make f continuous. And we're going to do the exact same thing we just did. We're going to take the pieces and we're going to set them equal to each other. And we're going to plug in the x value that they share. In this case, okay, x minus 4 and ax plus b, they are sharing that x equals negative 2. So I'm going to say, all right, x minus 4 needs to equal ax plus b at x equals negative 2. But then I also need ax plus b to equal x plus 2 at x equals 1. Because those other two pieces, those need to meet up as well in order for f to be like a fully continuous function. Okay, now I'm going to plug in those x values of negative 2 and positive 1. When I plug in x equals negative 2, I get negative 6 equals negative 2a plus b. And when I plug in x equals 1 to the equation on the right, I'm going to have a times 1 plus b, that's a plus b, equals 3. Okay, now here we've got two equations with two unknowns. We are going to need to solve this system using substitution or elimination. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong idea here. I'm just going to tell you this is probably the only AP calculus problem type that I'm aware of that requires substitution or elimination. Um, but I have seen it. It does require it. So, you know, do whatever technique you feel most comfortable with. If you're a substitutor, substitute. If you're an eliminator, eliminate. I'm an eliminator. Okay, I teach the matrix algebra class, and you know if you go on and, and take a class like that, you'll see um, that they're really all the same, and that also, you know, once you practice elimination a lot, you get really good at it. So I'm going to label that one as the red equation, and this one as the blue equation. I see that negative 2a, and I would like to eliminate using that, so I'm going to double the blue equation, copy the red equation, be like, okay, yeah, I can add these together, and that will eliminate the a's. So I add these together, and I'll get 3b equals 0. And that's telling me that b equals 0. Okay. And looking back, look at the original equations. Look at the easier one. a plus b equals 3. b equals 0. That means a needs to equal 3. Okay, so I'm just going to throw a box around that and be happy. That's how we solve the continuity problem where the piecewise function has three pieces. All right, so the last piecewise function example I've got for you is determine whether this function is continuous at 1 and 3. Okay, and how we're going to do that is we're going to analyze the limits, we're going to analyze the value of the function, make sure they're equal. If they're equal, that's going to be continuous. If they're not equal, that's going to be discontinuous. Okay. You can draw a picture of this if you wanted, but I feel like that's maybe a little bit more work than is necessary. So let's start with x equals 1. We're going to consider the limit as x approaches 1 from the left-hand side, from the negative side. Okay, so we're going to use that rule for when x is less than 1. x to the 2 plus 2x. So I'm going to put in 1, 1 to the 2 plus 2 ones, that's going to be 3. Okay, this looks promising. I see that f of 1 is equal to 3. Now I'll get to that in a second. Think about the limit from the right-hand side as x approaches 1 from the positive side of f of x. That's going to be 1 to the 3rd plus 1 squared plus another 1, and that's going to be 3. And we're also seeing that f of 1 is equal to 3. So since all three of these are the same number, I can conclude that f is continuous at x equals 3. Oh, wait, that's x equals 1. Oh, no. Okay, x equals 3, we're going to need to consider the left hand and the right hand limit and the value of the function. But maybe you kind of see something that catches your eye. I see that 2x plus 1 at 3, that's going towards 7. And then I see a 0. Those aren't the same number. And I don't know if you were wondering, but if we see any two of these numbers that aren't identical, that is going to be game over. It's going to be discontinuous. I'll let you think about why that's true. So we're going to look at the limit from the right of f, which is going to be 2 times 3 plus 1. Okay, that's 7. But f of 3 is equal to 0. And see, these are two different numbers, right? The value of the function is not equal to the limit from the right. Um, we need the value of the function to be equal to the limit in general. 
Okay, so you know if it's not equaling one of the one-sided limits, this is not going to be continuous at all. So we're going to conclude f is discontinuous at x equals three. It's going to have a jump discontinuity. Okay, another kind of something that's related to continuity is this theorem here. If you've got two functions that are equal everywhere except for some x value, which would be what would happen like with the simplifying and having a hole in the graph, then their limits are always equal. And this means that we can simplify limits using algebraic properties. Okay, so this is the type of problem that I had kept out of my calculus course for a long time because I was like, ah, oh, this is much easier when you learn L'Hopital's rule. Okay, but having gone with uh, y'all all the way through pre-cal last year, I saw that this is actually something y'all are pretty good at. And maybe by keeping these problems away from y'all, I was hiding some of the questions y'all would find easier from you. And so I'm going to bring this back in and, and we can do a little bit of algebra. So the key here is we're going to need to factor the numerator and the denominator. There's nothing I can do with the numerator, but the denominator I can factor out an x. So I'm going to start down that road. And then I'm going to see what I'm left with. Oh, x squared minus 16, that's a difference of two squares. I can continue factoring. And then I notice, oh wait, I've got an identical factor on top and bottom. They cancel. So once I do cancel those, I'm left with a 1 in the numerator and an x times x plus 4 in the the denominator and once I'm to the point where if I did plug in x equals 4 I'm not going to be dividing by 0 then I can try again and see what I'm gonna get so this is gonna be 1 over 4 times 4 plus 4 so that's 1 over 4 times 8 and if you felt like it you could simplify that to 1 over 32 but you don't necessarily have to unless it's a multiple choice problem okay, now here's another kind of simplify me algebraically limit um, I don't like this one as much as the other one, but, you know, it's, it's kind of in the same family. And, and for an introductory calculus course, it would probably be remiss of me not to show you this limit. Okay, so the limit is x approaches 4 of 1 fourth minus 1 over x divided by x minus 4. If I was to plug in 4, I would get 0 in the numerator and the denominator, which is sometimes a hint that you could keep going and, and do more work and eventually find yourself an answer. Okay, so what we're going to need to do is obtain a common denominator. So for the 1 fourth and the 1 over x. So I'm thinking 4 times x is going to be my common denominator. So I think that 1 fourth, I need to multiply it by x over x. And that 1 over x, I need to multiply it by 4 over 4. And then I will have the common denominator. I can put those together and I'll have one fraction with a denominator of 4x and a numerator of x minus 4. And that denominator is a of x minus 4 is just going to say the same. But I'm going to write it as a fraction to make it really clear what's about to happen, right? I'm dividing two fractions, so, you know, maybe you've got your own way of dealing with fraction arithmetic. I know in the school district I work in, oftentimes the elementary and middle schools, they talk about keep the top the same, change the division to multiplication, and flip the bottom. Okay, if that's familiar to you, great. If not, flip and multiply, however you do it. This is what it needs to be. Okay, we're going to notice we have identical factors in the numerator and denominator. We're going to cancel those off and rewrite the limit. Let's say, okay, this is equivalent to the limit as x approaches 4 of 1 over 4x. And this is, again, the type of thing that if I plugged in 4, I would no longer be divided by 0. So I'm just going to go for it and say 1 over 4 times 4, that's 1 16th. All right, now I've got a few extra examples, and I do think these would be good for you to like kind of work on your own and then check your work against mine. But if you're just trying to, you know, make sure you've got all the things, all the boxes checked, all the examples filled out, you can just feel free to work along these with along with me on these two. Okay, if we want to know whether a function is continuous and it's a fraction, what we want to do is grab its denominator, set it to, set it equal to zero, because the zeros of the denominator will always be discontinuities of the function, either removable or non-removable. So I'm going to grab that. And I'm going to set it equal to zero. And if x squared minus 25 equals zero, that's where x squared equals 25. And we were just talking about this today in my calculus class, the, uh, the whole square root thing. Really, the square root does mean the positive square root. And so this is the perfect time for me to show you what I'm talking about. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides of this equation, right? And I'm going to have the square root of x squared, which I was just telling you maybe today or recently, was the absolute value of x. And that's going to equal the square root of 25, which is positive 5. Okay. That means the absolute value of x is equal to 5, and that would work if x was either 5 or negative 5. Now, we were asked if the function was continuous in the interval 0 to 8, and x equals 5 is right there in the middle of the interval 0 to 8. So we're going to have some kind of discontinuity there. I'm going to say, no, this function is not continuous on the interval 0 to 8 because I found a place between 0 and 8 where there is a discontinuity. 
with g of x, I grab that denominator, I set it equal to 0, I start trying to solve, and it's like x squared equals negative 25. Wait a second, x is not going to be a real number. So there aren't going to be any x values between 0 and 8 that cause the denominator to equal 0. And so I'm going to say yes, the function is continuous because there's no zeros of the denominator. But with h, we've got natural log of x minus 5, and that's a whole different type of function. And I think what you need to know about natural log is that you can only take the log of a positive number. We can't be taking the log of 0 or a negative number. So I might grab the inside and say, okay, when is that equal to 0? Okay, that would be when x is equal to 5. Okay, now, when x is less than 5, I just noticed it's the log of the absolute value of x minus 5. So negative isn't going to be a problem. But x equals 5 is definitely going to be a problem. So I'm going to say, no, it's discontinuous. Okay, maybe, you know, go on decimals.com and sketch the graph of h of x equals natural log of x minus 5, and you'll see what I'm talking about there. We'll have a vertical asymptote, but otherwise the graph will be continuous. Alright, for these next two, you know, you grab the denominator, set it equal to 0. e to the x minus 1 equals 0. Now you might be thinking, alright, well maybe x is equal to 1. But think about it for a second. If x is equal to 1, I'm taking e to the 0 power. And e to the 0 is not 0, it's equal to 1. Okay, moreover, if I tried to solve this equation by, say, taking a natural log of both sides, I'd be trying to take a log of 0, and we just said that's not possible. So there aren't any zeros of the denominator, so I'm going to say, yes, this function is continuous for all real numbers. Now for this one, we're interested in, is this third degree polynomial ever going to be able to equal zero? And you are not expected to be able to solve this one. We don't use the cubic formula in here, and that's not factorable. So this is not something you can really solve. You just have to think about a cubic polynomial. Now a cubic polynomial, at its most interesting, with a positive leading coefficient, might look like that. But because of the directions of those arrows, wherever the x-axis is on this graph, and I don't even know if it's got two bends or what this thing actually looks like, but regardless, because the end behaviors point in opposite directions, there's got to be at least one x-intercept. So I'm going to say no, this one is not going to be continuous because there's got to be at least one zero of the denominator. There could be more than one, right? But there's at least one place where the denominator is equaling zero, so this thing can't be continuous everywhere. Okay, now the last example I've got for you, this is one I want you to do on your own. Okay, what you're going to want to do is kind of like plug in x equals 0 to all of these pieces and see what's happening. And then be very careful about d, you know, paying attention to the difference in the domain on the domains on d versus the other three. Um, and think of which of these is going to be continuous, which of these is going to have a jump discontinuity, which is going to be removable, and which is going to have a vertical asymptote. I think vertical asymptote should be the easiest of all. Um, that'll be some place where I'm trying to divide by 0. Right. Okay, so go for it. You've got this. Um, you know, work it with video pause because I'm going to bring in the answers in about five seconds. All right, there you go. Okay, so that's going to be all um, for the examples related to continuity. This ended up being a longer video than I expected, but I did quite a few examples. And I feel like this was pretty comprehensive in terms of like what you can be expected to do with the actual like problems to solve in AP Calculus that relate to continuity. There are also plenty of multiple choice questions out there that get about the theory and whether these things must be true, but I'll kind of roll those out to you over time. So that's going to be all for this video. Thanks for watching.